Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And let me tell you, okay? Okay. What are you telling me? (laughs) I have no idea why, but nothing brings me more joy when I um, am able to link stories together. Okay. I just have no idea why that makes me so thrilled, but it truly does. I just wasn't sure where you were taking that. And considering what we talk about on the podcast all the time, I was like, um. Which is what? what? (laughs) Like. Cats? Yeah. (laughs) Meow. That's it. That's all we talk about is cats all the time. Actually, (laughs) we must talk about them far more often than I actually think in my head. Because I get so many emails from people that um, talk about, like, our cats and (laughs) and people that send me pictures of their cats. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) So um, it just always makes me go, you know what? Maybe we do talk about them a lot, but that's not going to change. No. No, it sure is not. (laughs) Yeah. But as you may recall, in our last episode, it was themed around... Soap. Unfortunately, I do so, recall. I have another story. About fucking soap? About soap. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. What is happening? Right. Um, also, I don't think I like it no, because like... You might. Well... Well, not not really. <sighs> all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Went um, a lot of different directions very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in this one, I will say um, I do not speak Italian. So I looked okay. up all of these words, and I'm telling you right now, I don't want to hear about it if you think it's wrong. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's it. You will hear that I am putting oh so God. much effort into this, and I'm really going for oh, the damn yes. thing. Oh, yes. Does this mean you Googled a bunch of things? Absolutely. Yes. Literally everything. You know this is my favorite. I knew how to say nothing. So you're going to give everything an accent. Got Probably. it. Probably. Okay. It just comes out that way. I love it. Uh, so, yeah, I I did my best, and I'm going to say everything real confidently. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, But I did use... Two books for this one. Um, it was The Deadly Soap Maker of Correggio. Okay. By Genevieve Ortiz. And the second one was called The Curse by Ryan Green. What the hell <laughs> so... is going on right now? <laughs> well, today we're going to be talking about Leonardo Cinciulli also known as the soap maker of Correggio. And I'll drop some uh, little trigger warnings, which I don't really do often. However, this one has like attempted suicide, rape, domestic violence, miscarriages, and much more. Okay, that is so we're just be gonna an intense one. All right. Blanket it in that. Yep. And this is gonna be a two parter. Hooray! I'm I don't know how I'm feeling about that yet. (laughs) So now that we've got that set up for you, here we go. Okay. Could someone truly be cursed before their life even begins? This case makes people wonder if it's a possibility. Curse or true monster? Oh. (laughs) Regardless of what you believe. Leonardo's story began long before she was even born. Well, you're really setting this one up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Montella Avellino was a kingdom of Italy at the time. Emilia Dinolfi was born into wealth and noble status. Once she was of age, her parents began looking for potential suitors. They had no idea that a man in town had been watching young Amelia. Mariano Cinciulli was not on the list of the potential suitors for Amelia because they were not in the same social circles, like weren't of the same class. This is precisely why Mariano despised her, even though he was obsessed. He was so 
pissed off because she was out of reach and he wanted to ruin her. In 1893, Amelia went to a chaperoned dinner party with her friends and some potential suitors, and then she was heading home alone afterwards. Mariano was drunk. He had been drinking a bottle of cheap wine, and he was waiting in the shadows to catch her. Ew. It's disgusting. He saw Amelia and followed her. He drug her into the bushes, and at first... Amelia actually thought that it was a friend playing a prank on her. Oh, no. So, as Mariano started tearing at her clothes, Amelia believed that she was being robbed. So she's like, I don't have a purse. She had been raised in a very sheltered environment, and her parents had never talked to her about sex or anything else along those lines. Oh, no. Right. So she had no idea what was going on when Mariano raped her. Amelia went home afterwards and did not tell a single person what had happened. God, that's got to be so confusing. That's exactly it. She was confused and she was ashamed. She was also afraid of what people would think if they did find out what happened. Amelia had a Catholic upbringing, and the Italian had very strict views on sex before marriage. Now, we obviously call it like it is. It was rape. But Amelia took it as if she herself had sinned. I mean, when you don't know. Right. I mean, absolutely. She didn't understand that it. completely makes sense. Yeah. She decided that she was going to keep this a secret. But she couldn't hide it for long because she was pregnant. No. Yep. No. And it gets worse. Okay. Oh, God. Okay, okay, okay. When her parents realized that she was with child, they were furious. They demanded. Did they force her to abort? No. Okay. No, they did not. Okay. Um, they did something terrible though oh god okay so at first they were demanding they were like you need to tell us who the father is and she refused to tell them but her parents were like well if you don't tell us then we're gonna go out and we're gonna go door to door until we find out who the father is so she was forced to tell them the name mariano chinchuli This brought great shame to the family because she was pregnant before marriage and it was a man from a lower status. So, the horrifying thing that her parents did was something Amelia could never have expected. They invited the Chinchuli family to their home. No, 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 I was so hoping you weren't going to say that. And they were like, listen, Amelia is pregnant. To preserve her honor... You need to marry her. So they literally handed her over to her rapist. They're like, she is no longer pure. And they basically blamed her for uh, allowing a man to rape her, apparently. This is fucking disgusting. It's so twisted. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so they're like, now you two must get married. This poor, 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 poor girl. Yes. So they had a small ceremony, but Amelia and Mariano hadn't even spoken a word to each other. Their parents had done all of the wedding planning, and they were the ones that made the negotiations for them. So awkward. Mm-hmm. On top, of like, j- like uh, we're, you know, ignoring everything else. Like that is very, very, very awkward. On top of like, you know yeah. what I mean? And Mariano's like, um. <laughs> This could not have worked out better for me. Ew. I'm a predator and I got what I wanted. You know what I mean? Once the wedding was over, Amelia's family cut her off. Well, are yeah. you shitting me? She was no longer welcome in their home. They literally fucking dumped her Goodbye. on the rapist and then peace. Yeah. So the newlyweds were actually sent to live in the poorest part of town. It wasn't anything like the home that Amelia had been used to and grown up in. It didn't have any furniture, and the bathroom was outside, so they had to share it with a row of other houses. And shit, going from, like, being sheltered to that? 
Right. That is a huge change, and you're not going to know what the hell to do. Absolutely not. No. Everything she loved was taken away from her, and she's forced to marry this guy. Amelia refused to consummate the marriage. So we know how that's going to end up. Yep, unfortunately. Um, uh, yep. He raped her again and again. He also beat her when she failed to keep the house clean or cook the meals to his liking. Mariano wasn't home often because he was either working or drinking, so Amelia was home alone pretty much all the time. She had grown up in wealth and now lived in poverty. She hated Mariano, and she hated the baby growing inside of her. Leonardo Cinciulli was born on April 18th of 1894. Amelia was home alone, you know, because Mariano was, of course, out drinking and nobody showed up when she was screaming in her home. Of course home. not. Amelia was finally able to make her way into the streets and she was begging for help as all the drunk people were walking by. Finally, a local woman took pity on her and sent a runner to go get the town's midwife. The labor was extremely long, and Amelia slipped in and out of consciousness. But Leonarda was finally born. She was never able to bond with her daughter and wasn't affectionate towards her. Okay, but I on this one, like... It's hard. Yeah. I mean, she's young. She uh, obviously, you know, was raped. Like, I don't blame her, to be honest. Like, forced to be with this man. Yeah. Her parents left her. And that's so, what I'm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't have the mental capacity to understand it. As awful as, as it is that she couldn't bond with her daughter, nobody was helping her to do that. R right. And I'm sure she had a lot of things running through her brain. Absolutely. Amelia felt that Leonardo was responsible for ruining her life. She would have never been forced to marry Mariano if she wasn't pregnant. The family had to move around town many times because they were thrown out of ho homes because they couldn't pay. Amelia and her daughter survived for the most part on the money that they were receiving through the church. Amelia felt ashamed that she constantly needed donations to get by, but it's not like she had a choice here. She frequently beat her child and told her no. she was worthless. Oh, no. You see where this cycle's going? Oh, no. Yep. That is so heavy for a kid to take on. Mm -hmm. That is awful. And things got so bad that Leonardo actually attempted suicide twice. Okay. You were just not making me real happy right now, Megan. No, no. When she was 13, she tried to hang herself, and she made a noose by tying together old bed sheets and then hung them over the rafters in the farmhouse that they were staying in. But the noose came apart before it was able to end her life, and she spent a week unable to speak because her larynx was crushed. That is awful, but she wasn't meant to die. Right. Now, her mother made sure to tell her that she was disappointed that she did not succeed. That's really, 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 really sad. And so this next part is, like, different in both books that I read. So. In one of the books, it says that when she attempted uh, to take her own life again, she did it in the same manner. The other book says that she tried to swallow glass and ended up oh. getting sick from it. Oh! Which is, like, oh horrifying to oh, even no. consider. Like, don't get me wrong. No, no. It's horrible to think about either way. But swallowing glass oh, is a no, no, special no. kind of torture. Yeah. yeah I was just is. like, whoa, okay, was not expecting that. So, not sure which one it was, but we do know there was two attempts. Okay. 
One night, three years into the marriage, Mariano did not come home. This wasn't super abnormal initially because he often got drunk and then wouldn't come home for a few days. After several days, though, Amelia realized this might not be the normal drinking binge. So her and her daughter wandered around the streets looking for him. They found him at a friend's home. He had been running a fever, and he was in a deep sleep, so nobody could wake him up. I was going to say, should I just let his ass be lost? Um, okay, so essentially, here's what she did. They brought him home, and Amelia put him in a separate room and left him there until he died. She did not help him. She did not bring him food. Nothing. He was on his own. Um, she was just waiting until it was over. She was relieved when he finally did die because now she's free and she gets a second chance. She wanted to find a new husband. On the day of the funeral, it took everything she had to keep the smile from her face. She waited until everybody left that day, even the gravediggers. And she stepped forward and spit on his grave before heading home for dinner. I had a feeling you were going to say that. Yeah. And, like, I get it because, like, he was a piece of shit. But absolutely. Also, I could never because I would definitely feel like I was going to be haunted by, like, everybody from, from then on out. I agree. I would probably be a little too scared yeah, for that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I can totally understand why she did yep, this. Yeah, 100%. And I don't blame her. So pretty much as soon as he was buried, she began going on dates again, and um, she fell for a man that spent a lot of money on her. This is exactly what she was looking for. Um, okay, well, teach their own, I guess. Sure, sure. What she didn't realize was that her new husband did not actually make a lot of money. And he burned through all of the money by showering her in gifts. Huh. So he was just kind of pretending. <laughs> Whoops. Yep. Leonarda was left home alone often since her mother was out gallivanting around town with her new husband. She actually started getting beatings more often from her mother as if she was, like, a constant reminder about her troubled past. Oh, because like, now he's gone and yeah. she's... I'm still tied to this yes. kid type thing. Yeah. Since her mom had never paid attention to her, Leonardo had no idea that she was actually planning to use her to climb her way back up the social ladder. Great. Mm hmm. This is all really healthy stuff going on. Obviously. Here, as you can tell. That's what I'm that's what I'm definitely feeling right now. Yeah. Perfect. When Mariano died. Amelia thought that she was going to be welcomed back home, but her parents still saw her as an embarrassment. Her new husband didn't earn enough money, and so she was starting to get desperate. She was like, how do I get back to the old life that I wanted? So Amelia started meeting up with other families and looking for a wealthy man to marry her daughter. Gold digging. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. And she made arrangements with someone, but she never thought to tell her daughter about this. And Leonarda had plans of her own. She craved attention and had already been out searching for a man. She met Raphael Pansardi, who worked as a registry office clerk. He asked for her hand in marriage, and she said yes. Damn, so they're both just doing the same thing. Behind each other's backs? I mean, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Leonardo was, you know, she's not getting the attention she needs at home. Her mother doesn't give a shit about her, so yeah. she finds a man that does. Peace out. Yeah, and she's out dating this guy for a while, doesn't tell her mom. Her mom's looking for a man for her, doesn't tell her daughter. It's like, oh my goodness. This is uh, <laughs> not a good cycle here. It's a situation. It is. And it turns into more of one. Oh, Okay. So Leonardo is super excited that she's going to get married. And so she tells her mom the good news. And Amelia said, but, 
that he doesn't have money, huh? <laughs> well, Amelia was like, yeah, that's not the guy that I picked for you. So she said that she placed a curse on her and Raphael for ruining her life a second time, and she refused to show up to the wedding. Fucking rude. Yeah. Leonardo never saw her mother again. But the rejection and curse lingered in her mind forever. She needed to carry the fucking pig up the mountain. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Isn't it a pig? So that she uh, could break the curse. Madame Zeroni could break the curse for her. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> Okay. So, for some reason, when you said that, I was picturing what's her friggin' face from uh, Emperor's New Groove, and I was like, she did not carry a pig. Yeah. Where did... What? (laughs) I don't know what's going on. How did Isma get pregnant? How did Madame Zeroni come in? Because she... (laughs) Was feeling the lingering curse. Okay. So she needed to carry the pig up the mountain. Yeah. And then she needed to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. I need to watch that again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. <laughs> I'm going to believe you. I'm fairly Because I positive. don't remember. <laughs> oh, no. A-R-M-P-I uh, yeah, to the T. Is- what is that? You're smelling <laughs> dog? That's me. <laughs> I don't take showers and I don't brush my teeth. (laughs) All I do is dig holes, eat, and sleep. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Oh, no. Um, Okay. Well, yep. Anyway, she needed to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. So there we go. Cool. Well, that's what they should have done here. Yes, correct. That's where I was trying to get out all along. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Got it. (laughs) All right. We're on track. Um, Even though she was finally removed from the abuse, she struggled with all of the trauma. She began having seizures. She cried often and had high anxiety. She wasn't able to afford a doctor, so she couldn't be diagnosed or treated. Raphael was a kind and patient man, but he had also lost many jobs, and they started to realize that Leonardo's mother was spreading gossip around town to turn everybody against them. It's really nice. Mm-hmm. She is relentless. Right. And so now they're like, okay, well, we can't get a job here, so they needed to move. But what do you need to move? Monies. And they didn't have that. Leonardo had been brought up with her mother's Catholic faith. But she was very superstitious and began developing an interest in the supernatural. And this led her to a fortune teller. She asked if the curse was going to cause her to die. The fortune teller told her she wasn't going to die for a long time. But her life would be filled with sadness. She said that Leonardo was going to outlive every one of her children. She left with a lot of grief and regret. What if she chose to listen to her mother? Would that have given her a chance to be happy? Raphael thought the predictions were hogwash. The couple had trouble conceiving their first child, but in 1920, so this was three years into their marriage, Leonardo was pregnant. Okay, you're freaking me out, though, because (laughs) the fortune teller thing felt very relevant. Did it? (laughs) Are you foreshadowing over there, Megan? Yep. Oh, no. All sorts of foreshadows. Now, when she got pregnant, this actually catapulted her into a fear bubble. She was terrified that the fortune teller would be right, and all the worry and anxiety just made her sick. Oh, no. Come on. So... Leonardo started having more seizures and often fell or injured herself. Something she was doing to try to give herself less anxiety ended up doing more harm. Way more. Yeah. And it's, I mean, she probably had like some form of epilepsy or something. Yep. But 
you know, it's not going to be diagnosed. She can't. Her biggest fear soon came true when she ended up having a miscarriage. Now, to her, this was proof that the curse existed. Raphael knew he had to do something. So he was like, that's it. We are moving. Not just once, many times. Over the next year, they moved from one small town to the next, and they finally settled down in his hometown of Loria Potenza. Being far away from her mother actually calmed Leonardo down a great deal. Okay, and how sweet is it that he was like, let's move everywhere we can to try to get you to feel better? Yeah, whatever helps. I know. And she started showing less symptoms of her illness and was hopeful that things were going to get better for her. In 1922, Leonardo gave birth to Giuseppe. And she devoted all of her time to her son. This soon turned into overprotectiveness or like a helicopter mom type deal because she was so worried. She had those fears still, yeah. Yeah. And she was like, you know what? This curse is still hanging over me. What if something happens? So she ended up isolating her son from the other kids and always wanted him to stay home. See, it's so unfortunate because like, She's trying to do good, but that's going to end up doing a lot of harm. Yeah. Lots and lots of damage here from that. Yep. The family began having money issues again, so Leonardo had to get a job herself. Both her and Raphael wanted more children, so they kept trying, but this resulted in more miscarriages. It took a few years, and she finally birthed a baby girl, And then she soon had two more children, a boy and a girl. So she had four kids at this time. The oldest daughter got a cough. And this soon passed down to the other daughter. They both had fluid in their lungs and were struggling to breathe. But Leonardo and Raphael didn't have money for a doctor. So all they could do was stay up with them and try to keep them comfortable. Leonardo went out again and got a job so that she could get money to take her kids to the doctor. Then, her youngest son developed a rash that covered his whole body. And the next day, he was found dead in his crib, and the two daughters also passed away. All three? All three. So she's just got one left, Giuseppe. (sighs) That horrific. That, yeah. I know. Leonardo knew that this curse was just killing everyone she loved. She fell into a deep, dark depression. She stopped working, stopped leaving the house, and stopped eating. She became even more protective of Giuseppe because he was her miracle baby. Over the next few years, Leonardo had five successful pregnancies, and they were all boys. Each one of the five boys died from Megan. sudden illnesses by the time they were toddlers. And um, Leonardo actually said, almost every night I dreamed of small white coffins swallowed one after the other by the black earth. That is so many kids to lose. I can't imagine. When, I mean, good grief. I mean, it's already like impossible to deal with yeah and, and then you had that much heartache and oh. the crippling anxiety that you had already from that incident yeah probably spirals real bad and she just wants a family and obviously you know that it has something to also do with her childhood of being so neglected right. and never having anybody to care for her right so it's like okay well then i'm going to create my own family yes. that will And she just keeps losing them. It's awful. It should be no surprise that Leonardo fell into another depression. Raphael begged her to help. He was like, I cannot financially support this family on my own anymore. He needed her to get a job, but she couldn't bear to leave her only son by himself. She needed to watch him to make sure that he didn't get sick too. It took some time and persuasion, but 
Leonardo did get a job as an evening bank cleaner. Don't you dare tell me that her other kid died. Giuseppe does not. Okay. Ooh. I will give you that. I literally was so tense over here. I was like, if you're about to tell me she got a job and then he <sighs> dies right after, I'm going to be so pissed. No. By the time she would get to work, all of the clients and clerks were gone. So it worked great for her because she didn't get super overwhelmed. She was expected to clean the bank, but her employers made her bring her own cleaning supplies. Leonardo started experimenting with different raw materials, and she learned how to make her own soap. Oh, <laughs> I forgot that this story had any damn thing to do with soap. <laughs> we have come so far from that. Yes, yes. <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> It gave her a sense of purpose, and she desperately needed that. It also gave her a lot of time to herself and time to realize how poor her family actually was. I can't believe this actually came back to soap. (laughs) I told you we were going to get there. I completely, (laughs) 100%, had already dumped that. That Uh was gone. Sure. Sure. Wow. (laughs) It'll keep coming back. As you predicted, but it's not Giuseppe. While she was at work, her 10th child died. Are you shitting me right now? No. 10th? Mm Mm-hmm. But nobody went to the bank to tell her because, like, how could you? I know it's awful not to tell her, but who can possibly break news like that? So she found out when she arrived home that evening. And one night she decided to go into the restricted area of the bank where they kept the ledgers. She created a fake account and assigned a decent amount of money to this account. Now, I saw this next part cited different in both books, One says that when Leonardo showed up for work the next day, she was apprehended by the police and charged with fraud. But the other says that she attempted to clear out the account one day, and that's when she was apprehended. Either way, they got her, but I'm not sure which one. Okay, well, at least they got her. Right. And she told the police that her crime was impulsive and she had been, quote, seized by madness. So she was convicted of fraud in 1927 and faced 18 months in prison. That's a lot of time to think. Yep. She was sent to an institution which had once served as a nunnery. She had been so severely tortured by her mother, so they ended up not being able to break her. Like, she just breezed by through this. Well, I mean... I hate to say it, but it makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. Like, the mother superior could not intimidate Leonardo. Yeah. And she didn't cause any problems during her sentence and ended up being released in a little over a year. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. When she got home, she found out that Raphael had lost his job and his reputation was ruined. Oh, goody. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, so we're back to square one. Exactly. And he had also changed. You know, he used to be kind and gentle, and now he was coming off as cruel and angry. And well, you again, can't blame him for being a little pissed about this. Right. And like I was saying, like, that's a long time to think. Yeah. And she wasn't the only one thinking. I mean, he sure is, too, because she's not around all the time. Exactly. You know, and now he's taking care of their kid and he's on his own and he loses his job yeah. because of her actions. And at this point, the town really looked down on him and his own family had turned their backs on him as well. He did have some extended family that was willing to give them a little money so that they could move away. So they ended up moving to Lacedonia Avellino and hoped to start over again. Leonardo suffered more miscarriages, but okay, two Yo. more kids did survive. She is busy. Yes. Shit. So uh, let me break that down. 
Um, she had been pregnant about 16 times. Oh, my God. And only three survived. How, how do you even keep getting pregnant at that point? Because, like, I know that, like, she so desperately wanted that family. But, like, after that much loss, I truly don't think, like, I'd be able to keep go- keep going with it. Like, I'd be how? so terrified. And devastated. Yeah. I don't know. In their new town, Raphael was able to get a good-paying job, and Leonardo was able to stay home with the kids. She ended up visiting another fortune teller. Wh- why? <laughs> why? She got why? real fascinated with this. Oh, no, um, no, 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 no. We, so she... <laughs> we already went down this road. Uh-huh. It did not end well. Okay. So she gets there. And, you know, they have her hold out her palms, and the fortune teller said in one hand she could see a prison. On the other, she saw an insane asylum. So, I mean, neither of those Uh, sounds that great. Nope. Okay. (laughs) What's option C, please? (laughs) There's no more palms. (laughs) (laughs) Read my foot. I don't care. Just give me a fucking option C. <laughs> Does that work? Can you read your foot? I don't know. Okay. But I'm going to have to find out about that. I'm going to have to Google things now when we get done with this. <laughs> yeah. She soon gave birth to her 17th and final child, a baby boy. So she had four surviving children at this time. The odd thing about this pregnancy is it felt very different to Leonardo. Giuseppe was still her favorite child, and she gave him the majority of her attention. And it was not a secret. Like, she would literally say he was her favorite. Oh. Yeah. That's very nice of her. Uh Uh-huh. She still took care of her other kids. It just wasn't in the same way. Oh, okay. That's great. And with this new child, she felt really confused. She was just waiting for the next terrible thing to happen. The sense of impending doom hung over her, and this only increased her anxiety, which meant she started having seizures again. She pulled away from her baby a bit because she was so scared that she would drop him or have a seizure while she was holding him. Leonardo decided that she should just accept that she was cursed, but she was like, okay. I am going to stay one step ahead. So she started visiting fortune tellers oh, and no. palm readers more often. And oh, she... hell. <laughs> you don't think no. that's good? No, obviously <laughs> fucking not, dude. <laughs> and she took special interest in learning how to predict things herself, and she started taking lessons in divination. Oh, no. hmm Oh, no, no. And then she got books on herbs and charms, and her new obsession with finding out the uh, future was actually driving a wedge between her and her family, because she was no longer present. She was so obsessed with learning all these new things. Really, really rough. In the town the family lived in, people would gather together in the fields after a long day's work, and they would celebrate the harvest. There was singing and dancing, and then people would just fall asleep under the stars. Leonardo, okay, if there wasn't so many serial killers, that would be amazing. And probably, like, way back when, it probably was really cool. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. No. Mm-mm. I would, uh, like, I wouldn't now, no. But it sounds cool. It does. I would if there wasn't, like, murders and stuff, you know. Sure. If we were in, like, a fenced-in, like, <laughs> or, like... You know what I mean? Like a huge fenced-in area or something? I would totally do it, but... No. Oh. <laughs> Just, uh, I don't feel good about it. Okay. <laughs> Leonardo and Raphael decided to take the kids out to join the celebration, and it was exactly what they needed. The kids were running around and playing with others, and their parents were finally getting some time to bond again. They danced all night until they finally fell asleep for a few hours. Leonardo woke up and something was wrong. She tried to get up, but lost her balance. The 1930 Irpina earthquake was a 6.6 on the Richter scale. Well, I did not see this coming. Destructive. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. 
The death toll was a little over 1,400 people, and Leonarda blamed her mother's curse for this. For killing? Yes. All those people. And I think that that ends up being a really big problem, like very narcissistic of her. Oof. Because everything in her life suddenly ties back to this curse. Everything is about her. Everything is about the curse. Yep. And something, you know, like this, like a natural disaster happens and and it's their fault. It's like that whatever the fuck movie it is with, with the numbers. Where he, like, res- brings everything back to the same number over and over and over. Yes. Yeah, and exactly. And can relate literally everything to it somehow. Mm-hmm, yeah. hmm The whole town had basically been reduced to dust. They lost their home, and the family decided to, once again, move to a new area. So they headed to Correggio and moved into a home attached to a general store that had been shut down for quite some time. Raphael had a good paying job, and they were no longer living paycheck to paycheck. Leonardo even decided to open up that abandoned storefront for palm readings, and she started making her soaps again. I told you that I'd come back. Uh, You did. (laughs) You did indeed. Her store was a huge success, and the townspeople were raving about her soaps. Requests started rolling in from all over Italy, and in her spare time, she started to learn other forms of magic as well, which included three different forms that are very difficult for me to pronounce, but here we go. So, the first one is called Strigeria. It's <laughs> You did have an accent. <laughs> Strigeria. <laughs> It's a branch of modern interpretation of folk magic that celebrates early Italian witchcraft. It's sometimes referred to as la vicia religione, meaning the old religion. This was a modern offshoot of the older witch cults that dominated the area before the rise of Christianity. Some academics consider it to be a form of Wicca because they both have similar beliefs and practices. The second one is Stregoneria. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure. A darker form of magic that is defined as a magical practice intended to produce harm or illness. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So not good. And the third is Benedicaria. This means way of blessing, but it's referred to as folk magic or witchcraft. It was the Tuscan traditional folk magic revolving around ancestor worship and household gods that stretched back to the Roman Empire. The traditions are almost exclusively used for healing, cleansing, spirituality, and religious devotion. Practices are linked with Italian popular devotions found in traditional Catholicism. You just be teaching me all sorts of stuff the last couple episodes, dude. Uh huh. <laughs> Giving me all sorts of lessons. Yeah. You're like hitting every like subject too. Good. I love that. Because <laughs> la- I think it was like science last time. Mm-hmm. Now we're hitting a different one. Exactly. All right. Got to get you some witchy stuff here, right? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Leonardo believed that she could fight her mother's curse if she practiced and learned magic. She wanted to free herself and her family of this curse and defend herself. To break the curse that bound her, she would need to learn how it was cast, meaning she would have to continue to venture down the path of studying dark magic. That's a slippery slope. It could be. Yep, yep, yep. (laughs) I was reading it and I was like, "Uh uh-oh, Leonardo, (laughs) are you sure? She learned how to make brevi bags, which are small cloth sacks that held items such as like herbs, ashes, or precious stones. And her spells made from herbs and oils became very profitable. She was telling the townspeople's futures, helping them find matches for marriage, and she was providing input about where they should plant the crops in their fields. 
So, like, basically anything that was happening, the townspeople had to consult with her all of a sudden. That's really um, not good. Right, right. (laughs) Yep. And it's giving her so much power over everybody. Right. And then on top of going down the dark magic, plus having a huge ego now. Right. Stroking that ego of Uh somebody that's real narcissistic. Uh Uh-oh. Hmm. Around this time, Benito Mussolini was in power and Italy was heading into war. They were recruiting as many healthy young men as possible. The recruits were led to believe that with their help, the Kingdom of Italy could return to the glory of the Roman Empire. In 1940, Leonardo's son, Giuseppe, was a literature student studying at the local university. Does he get called out? Um, no. Okay. Did not get called out. He wanted the opportunity to join the fight in World War II. He wanted to become a hero and finally break away from his protective mother. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. And he knew this decision was going to break her heart. So he kept it secret. Um, So that's a choice. (laughs) Uh, Yep. He figured that by the time she found out, it would just be too late for him, you know, or for her to, like, beg him to stay. I see why he did. Uh Uh-huh. I don't agree with... Nope. ...the choice. Yep. (laughs) But... But here we are. It happened. And, I mean, things had not been easy for Giuseppe. His mother was always consulting her cards or reading tea leaves before making any decisions. She read palms, dished out warnings to others, and spoke of almonds and curses. If Leonardo had a bad dream about something, she would spend the day purifying herself in the woods. There were nights that Giuseppe would wake up to find his mother standing over him, muttering things. Ew. Right. And one time he found a talisman under his pillow, and it was made of bird bones and bright thread. And he was disgusted, so he chucked it out the window. And he knew that his mother cared for him, but she was difficult to live with. And he just wanted to break free and try something different. Absolutely. His mom had always been so afraid that he was going to die that she didn't allow him to To live. live. Yep. Well. Leonardo ended up finding out that her son signed up for war when she was out shopping. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. One of the locals came up to her to express their admiration. Yep, that's what I thought you were going to say. Well wishes. Oh, no. Now, she simply smiled. No. And played it real cool. Oh, I've done that. Uh Uh-huh. And she finished her shopping and headed home. And then when she got there, she fell to the floor and started crying. It's once you, like, yeah, Mm -hmm. you got to get to the car. Yep. And make it there. Sure. And then it hits. Yep. No, I've definitely done that before. (laughs) Like, she thought that things were finally turning around and now her son is leaving her. She couldn't believe it. When Giuseppe returned home that night, the house was quiet. But he could hear his mother turning pages of a book and talking to herself. Oh, no. He was instantly filled with dread because it was really hard to predict which version of his mother he was going to be walking into. So he slowly crept to the top of the stairs, turned the door handle, and as the door opened, he saw his mom sitting at her desk. Her back was turned to him. At least Half a dozen books were lying around, and she was just, like, feverishly writing. Giuseppe reached out and touched her on the shoulder. He was expecting her to go mad, like, just lose it, because he knew that she had found out that he signed up for war. But instead, she smiled, and they went to the kitchen, and they got some dinner. (laughs) I see the look on your face, and I'm sure that's what Giuseppe looks like, too. Like, Yeah, and it's too calm. Like, clearly Uh she's going to do something soon. Something's brewing. This is like when your parents know that you lied, but they don't tell you you lied. Like, that they know, 
And then they just keep trying to catch you in it over mm-hmm. and over and they set all the traps and like wait for you to fall into them. Mm-hmm. This is what this feels like right now. Okay. Well, Giuseppe was surprised that his mother was so calm and he wasn't expecting it. Leonardo did try to gently talk him out of going and she asked like if there's any way that he could take back his consent. You know, is there a legal way out of this? But Giuseppe told her it was impossible, and he was like, besides, I already made up my mind anyways. I'm going through with this. God, it's the calm before the storm. (laughs) So she took matters into her own hands. She turned to all of the books that she had been studying, and she found exactly what she was searching for. In the study of alchemy, the law of equivalent exchange. Oh, God. Giuseppe's safety would come at a steep, steep price. To save his life, she would have to take somebody else's. Yo! It was the only way. (laughs) And she truly believed that it was morally justified to sacrifice someone to break the curse. It was for the greater good. Uh, Okay. (laughs) Leonardo also had to work out how to transfer the protection spell to her son once she completed the task. Oh, because he's not. Okay, yeah. Well, so she knew how to make those brevi bags, but when he's out fighting in war, he can't be expected to, like, carry that on him at all times, and then he wouldn't be protected. So that means she needed to smother his entire body in her protection spell somehow. Since Leonardo had studied so many herbs, she knew that she could easily come up with a remedy to overdose somebody that came into her shop. Even though this would be the easiest way to do it, it would also cause her some trouble, too. Like, if she overdosed somebody that came in, it would take a while for them to die. So they might be out wandering around the streets before dying, and then there would just be a body, and somebody else in town could find them first. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm do sorry. you see the conundrum? <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> I tried to hold it together till you sure. finished talking, but like <laughs> just picturing like this body wandering around for a while. Yeah. The fact that she's just like, oh, I'm gonna overdose them, but you know, they might take a few hours to die. They'd just be walking across the street and just fucking drop dead right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Shit. Ugh. So that wouldn't work. So she would need to come up with an idea that would give her full control so that they would die in her shop or in her home. As she crafted her plan, she realized that if she found a way to use soap and food, she could protect her son inside and out. Oh, okay. (laughs) And once she figured out the plan, she also knew who the sacrifice would be. Oh, she just knew. She knew. She's got someone in my... Okay. Oh, she's got someone. Oh, boy. I'm very concerned. But... Megan, don't you fucking dare. I swear. (laughs) Don't. You were the biggest jackass ever. (laughs) Ever? Dude. Why would... Ah, never mind. But we're going to find out next week. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) I'm I thought you would like that cliffhanger. You so much right now. I see it. I'm ignoring it. I don't appreciate it. <laughs> but no, hey, no buts. Told you there was gonna be soap. <sighs> <laughs> and there's gonna be a lot more soap in the second episode. I guessed that. Yeah. You did? Oh man. jesus dude (laughs) all right so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps tell us the stories you want to hear like us on facebook instagram twitter leave us a five-star review if you love us tell your friends tell your cats um bye. bye